So how was your, your new year? Happy new year. Happy 2019. Thanks, brother. My new year was fantastic, amazing. I set some really good intentions and I reflected on the year. It was uh, powerful. This was a really big year for you. I just saw that video you released and just the, um, well, we'll definitely get into it, but you, you've been through a lot this year and it was a huge year for you, for veganism, for activism. So awesome, man. Stoked to have you on here. Um, maybe for the people that don't know you, which I'm sure it's, it's going to be a small handful since, you know, I'm a vegan channel myself, but could you kind of talk about, you know, where you came from a little bit about your story and a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Yeah. So my internet name is Joey Carbstrong. Uh, my real name is Joey Armstrong. So it's a play on words there, but I come from quite a rough background, a colorful past. I started to experiment with uh, drug use at about the age of 14. So around high school, um, left high school really early, started hanging around, um, street level sort of gangs and, you know, drinking, using drugs, getting in, you know, fights. Then I started to use drugs a little bit more often. I started to become conditioned to gang culture and uh, street violence and sort of started to graduate up into the levels of sort of gangs that were started to become more organized, more serious. And yeah, sort of landed myself right in the thick of some pretty serious uh, underworld um, situations, uh, gang violence and criminal activity. Landed myself, long story short, landed myself with some serious psychological issues, um, conditioned to some pretty high levels of violence myself, and got caught by the police walking around with a loaded firearm down my trousers which was the biggest turning point for me because it landed me on house arrest. Now, whilst on house arrest, I was only left to my own devices <laughs> and was sort of, I had this boundary, like I couldn't leave the house because they put like a bracelet on your ankle, which is censored and like it's got a sensor on it, you can't leave. And, you know, so I was still, you know, self-destructive and destructive to others, but only within this boundary. So I felt like it was a, a blessing in disguise. I was still in gangs. I was still drinking alcohol and, you know, doing all these toxic things. I ended up putting on a lot of weight though. Like I, I got to a serious weight. I mean, I, I don't know what this is in pounds, but I was 115 kilograms. So like, I don't know, 230 pounds, 220 pounds. And I'm only 170 centimeters tall. So I'm not very tall. So I was obese, obese, and I was unhappy. I was eating so much steak and eggs and fried food and bacon every single day and drinking beer. It got me to a point where I was like, I've had enough. I've had enough of this. Like, you know, a girl's even going to want to, like, go out with me. I'm, I'm, I'm just, like, so depressed and overweight. That. I was violent, dep uh, anxious, had serious anxiety. So I was like, oh, I need, to I need to change this now. So I started looking for, on the, I was on the internet, looking for a diet to lose weight. Came across a raw foodist, uh, Dan McDonald, the life regenerator. Um, technically doesn't call himself a vegan. He's more like a raw food advocate, more of a health advocate. But I started watching him like religiously. I was totally not from my genre. You know, I'm a gang member active gang member at the time and he was just like peace and love sort of eat the high vibrational foods sort of hippie kind of guy was that when he was like um d doing like lots of juicing back in the day with like his like um rv and stuff yeah and he would wear like wigs yeah <laughs> and, like he was total stripper but he had big views on youtube at the time and I, I, he was just the like if you're looking for weight loss you'd come across his videos yeah so he didn't really speak in my language but Fundamentally, some of the things he said made a lot of sense to me. I mean, I was like, he was talking about <clears throat> the power of eating living foods. <clears throat> and then he was talking about dead food and like what dead foods are. But he he had this view like like cooked food is is dead food. But then then he started talking about cooked animals, like dead animals. And, you know, he was kind of talking about like karma and stuff like that. And I already had this belief in 
like what you put out, you get back. Because I had seen it in the gang life so much, I'd seen like you go out doing some bad stuff, it comes back on you, it had happened to me. Uh, I sort of had this, already had this belief instilled in me, like what you put out, you get back. Anyway, he sort of like, it wasn't like he taught me anything. It was like he showed me something I already knew. And like it just planted a very significant seed in my mind. A few actually, but it was more like eating plants, eating raw plants um, helps with weight loss, helps with weight loss and your health and eating, you know, dead food and dead animals uh, doesn't help with your spiritual health or your physical health. Um, and it's cruel and abusive, but that, that comes sort of later on. I ended up doing a juice fast. Okay. Um, green juice. So, so I went from beer, steak, you know, oil and fried food to asking my mum to go to the market for me because I couldn't leave the house and get a bunch of greens and, you know, ginger and lemon and carrots, sticking them through a juicer and drinking three liters of that every day. And it felt like I had just taken the best drugs I've ever taken. I, I seen like the world with more clarity. I had these rushes of like, it felt like endorphins or like my hair would stand on end whenever I drink these juices. I remember like having like a leader just sculling it in the morning, going outside and just like feeling like I could levitate. Like that's how much I, it had changed my vibration from like really down. And I didn't realize how down, how low I was until I started juicing getting uh, these these fruits. Basically, I was increasing my fruits, vegetables, nutrients, carbohydrates, all of that in one go. Anyway, I lost about 25 kilograms doing this juice fast. I used to mix alcohol with my juices. I was doing all these. I was eating uh, steamed vegetables when I couldn't um, adhere to this juice fast. It's an extreme type of dietary intervention. I probably There's easier, better ways, more mentally healthy ways of doing of losing weight and becoming healthy now. But for me, it, it changed the way I thought and it gave me some clarity. <clears throat> what ended up happening is I, I was on house arrest awaiting a prison sentence. So that's what they do. You get caught with a gun. You don't go to prison really straight away. They, they will arrest you, they will charge you, and then you will await your conviction. So I was awaiting my convic conviction for 18 months on house arrest. Then I went to prison <clears throat> and I, I was given um, 13 months with a six-month um, non-parole period. So I, I had to serve at least uh, six months in prison. So I went to prison and in prison, obviously, there was one fundament fundamental thing that changed for me in prison. And that was that I had limited or no access to drugs and alcohol. <clears throat> now I was still an active gang member at this time. And obviously that's where gang members go prison. So there was plenty of uh, gang members there and uh, in my gang in opposing gangs, but I had no drugs and alcohol. So I could, I, I didn't have that, crutch anymore to lean on and also to distort my view of reality <clears throat> and also to deal with you know some some things that in a sober mind would be a lot harder to deal with but in a in a drunken state really easy to deal with so I was sort of like I, I really started to see things with new eyes and I had like a bird's eye view of like what was going on like clarity sobriety so prison really woke me up a lot and I, I i trained exercise twice a day religiously in prison um and i started this is where the real turnaround started to happen i uh i started to see the gang life for what it was and i was like you know this i don't really know if i want to be a part of this anymore like I, or do i like i don't know maybe maybe you know i, I was just really unsure when I was released, um, I had a uh, parole. Parole's just like the police watch you. You have to sign in, you know, 
twice a week. They test your your urine for drugs and alcohol. So I had a barricade. If you get if you breach your parole, you go back to prison. I didn't want to go back to prison. It's terrible in there. Well, it's just yeah, it's not a good place for many reasons. But um, it sort of hindered my drug and alcohol use and it extended this period of sobriety and clarity for long enough for me to, you know, start to advocate for this new, new, new spiritual perspective. I was doing it on Facebook and stuff. I, I had a perspective on eating animals, okay, that, that had developed through my own, you know, with the seed planted and my own insight you know all it needs all you need is a seed someone to take that veil away and you start to like work things out easy to do when you're easier to do when you're sober for me anyway i had a, i was having a conversation with my mum about smoking cigarettes mum you shouldn't be smoking what are you doing you know because i was like this new you know self-righteous beam of sober light you know <laughs> trying to <laughs> awaken so I, no, well, I was just like who was I to talk to my mum about quitting <laughs> smoking when I'd just been an active gang member and like, you know, just doing all this bad stuff. Anyway, she kind of looked at me like, are you giving me advice on how to live my life? Look what you've just done for the last 12 years. <clears throat> anyway, uh, she said like, there's a lot of vices people have that they don't change, you know. And when she said that, like, I kind of reflected and I looked within and I was like, what is it about me that I haven't changed yet? And like, I could always do better. And I was like, well, I've been living in this state of hypocrisy about eating animals, you know, about not being vegan, you know, and I know the, the suffering and, the, you know, the injustice uh, that it is. And I changed it there and then. I said, you know what, mum, you're right. I'm going vegan tomorrow. Because I've been thinking about it, I knew I'd, I'd been advocating like to people who were like against, you know, dolphins being killed and, you know, the dog meat festival and um, saving the whales and they have a, a steak on their plate. Like people who are against palm oil but eating beef, you know, at, right. like I've seen that hypocrisy and I openly advocated um, like I was just like, listen. You cannot be an animal rights activist if you're not vegetarian or vegan. I didn't realize what vegetarian meant back then. Like, obviously, you still commit, you know, animal abuse as a vegetarian. But I was on the right track. So anyway, I just aligned everything, went full vegan the next day. <clears throat> Got uh, I, I left the gang shortly after that, um, which was a very hard thing for me to do um, because I, I'd always had them as, you know, backup and – I was off. I was on my own then, and I was I was riddled with uh, anxiety and fear about my own personal safety, and um, you know I didn't have alcohol or drugs to use to hide my emotions, and to, I had to deal with everything by myself. And I started riding around on my bike, eating fruits and vegetables, and spent heaps of time by myself, and tried to heal from the trauma of you know the extreme you know life that I'd led. And the shame and the guilt that came with it, it was a very tough time for me. But I stayed sober, stayed strong. And then, um, like, I had this burning desire in my heart that just grew, started growing inside of me. And I was like, you know, you got this second chance, Joey. You could have been killed so many times. You, you, you got friends that are in prison for huge, long stretches of time. You got friends that are still on drugs and you got – you know, people are, are dying and, you know, you've got this um, this second chance and it was just here burning and burning in my heart and you've got to do something. You've got to do something positive. You've got to leave a positive impact. And I was like, oh, there's another day wasted, you know, on, on this earth with my second chance, waking up from a nap. Oh, you went to sleep. You could have been doing something positive. It was like a desire. So I was advocating to friends and family. I was talking about animals. I was talking about veganism, heart disease, uh, diabetes, or Crohn's disease, all of these things. I was saturating myself with information. For some reason, it was almost like I was sharpening the sword for something ready to, uh, to come and saturating myself with all different types of information, environment, health, Gary Yorofsky, ethics. And I was like, okay. After a while, I was like, okay, I've got all this information. What am I going to do with it? I need to – leave this impact. I wanted to help people like leave gangs, get sober, get off the drugs. 
psychological health, uh, help, things like that. And I was like, well, there's a group of beings out here that need help more and they can't even speak up for themselves. They are more innocent, more vulnerable. They're the ones I need to defend. Even as an active gang member, I couldn't stand people being bullied. Um, animal, I wouldn't uh, sit there and let someone abuse an animal. Uh, I, just, I just wouldn't stand for that. So, yeah, I, I was like, they need my help the most. And then I started to actively uh, defend animals. Started a YouTube channel, grabbed my phone, started filming, and that's where it all began. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like you got into this more for health reasons, maybe just by chance. You just started watching videos like Dan the Man back in the day. Um, you started eating healthy. You got out of your gang life and away from that sort of lifestyle and just really realize what's what's going on and the other benefits of this lifestyle with helping animals and and you created your channel because of that you just wanted to share the message like how did how did you get into activism well the thing is i found veganism through health <clears throat> and this is what i try to explain to people health isn't veganism um health is health now yeah you can be a non-vegan and be unhealthy but People find the vegan message through plant-based health. So that's why I try to have that distinction there. When I was eating a healthy vegan diet, I wasn't really a vegan um, because diet is one aspect of veganism. It's an aspect that the philosophy leads to. It, 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 it encompasses. It encompasses diet, which is 90 Five percent of the abuse happens in diet, but then you've got you know fur and and animal skin and testing and uh, you know dog breeding and all of these other forms of animal exploitation that veganism also encompasses. So yeah, I I, I started to understand the fundamentals of veganism and animal rights, and becoming an activist was it came naturally with seeing injustice, right? Like let's just say like. You, you know, you're against child abuse, you have children, and you live in a world where children are being abused in front of your face constantly. Now, like, are you telling me that being an activist wouldn't come naturally to you? I mean, it's not like, okay, I, it's it's not a hard decision to make. It's just like, there's the abuse, everyone's committing it, um, mostly unknowingly. So this is the point of being an activist. If, so, if people are unknowingly, good people, unknowingly committing the worst abuse on the planet uh, secondhand, all they need is to know? You're going to sit there with your mouth shut? <laughs> of course, of course not. All you need to do is do a bit of this and feel a bit uncomfortable here and there, work out the best way, speak directly about what's going on, let people know. They're adults. If you're going, hey, dude, you know, if someone come up to me and goes, you know what, bro, no matter how they said it, no matter how someone said it to me, if they said, hey, bro, you just bought that cheeseburger, a cow's being stabbed in the throat for that. Did you know that? What? Show me evidence, please. Here's the video. Oh, my God. Thanks for telling me, eh? Like quite simple really like i think we overcomplicate it a little bit of course there there are probably better ways to deliver the message you know better or worse or whatever the worst way to deliver the message is to keep your mouth shut that is the worst because that does nothing for animals and for um helping the earth yeah absolutely i i totally agree i mean it's great to to get people to go vegan but i encourage them to do what they can I, I, you know anybody even if they're not social media tech savvy or whatever you know anybody can can still promote this message whether it's by ver wearing like simple merch you know with with veganism on it or just bringing a vegan recipe to a party or something like anybody could do their part with your videos like you you do you have like a wide variety of videos that you like to do one of the types is like you like to get into city centers you have like um either uh, like you approach individuals and you ask them questions about what do you think of veganism what do you think of you know what's going on here with this animal agriculture and stuff like that i want to ask you what what do you feel like is the best way or some of the best ways to convince people to go vegan what have you found to be the most successful i was the pioneer of filming outreach 
okay um it came naturally it wasn't something that i planned i was like having conversations with people and i was like i've got to film this i used to do it with my phone just down here hold my phone down and just film it i, I put all just like i didn't I cared more about getting the message out there than filming people without permission because, <laughs> hey, animals are being stabbed by the trillion. Are we going to ask everyone permission to get this message out there? No, that's that's where my morals lie. Now, I was the pioneer for putting outreach on the internet. It wasn't done before my channel, and now it is exploded all over YouTube with public outreach. I mean, I've inspired some of the most like uh, outreaches I consider better than than me at it. You earthling ads. You got uh, your James Aspies on there now doing that sort of thing. Uh, you got uh, oh, there's so many there's so many up and coming activists filming their outreach now. It makes me feel so filled with joy because I believe it is one of the most effective ways um, to, for one, advocate to an individual, which is powerful. You know, you can change one person that you can change their life forever. Show people that are already vegan how to advocate, okay? And people who are watching the videos who aren't vegan are getting outreached as well. So you get 20 I've – got, I've got some videos with 600,000 views on YouTube, my, like my, my debate with a farmer, okay? 600,000 views. People are watching how I debate with a farmer. Vegans are. Non-vegans are getting um, advocated to as well. This is if I just had that that conversation with the farmer, me and him, that's it. It doesn't matter if that farmer doesn't change. It doesn't matter to me. It, yeah, that would be great. Oh yeah, that'd be great. But I just reached six hundred thousand people. Right. And people are like, oh, you know, that that guy didn't change. You know, maybe you shouldn't have done it like this. Look, how you do it. There's some nuances. Uh, look, I believe Socratic method is king. Getting someone to realize it themselves, okay, with the with the right line of questioning. I believe that 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 way they 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 don't feel like they've been told something. They feel like they've worked it out for themselves. You leave someone with a, a question, it stays with them forever. They go in and ask family members, this, "Oh, is there a humane way to kill someone who doesn't want to die?" You know, planting a powerful seed. You don't have to change them there and then. Like I wasn't changed immediately. It was a process for me. It's planting a seed. But what I've learned, Tino, is that, you know, people say, Joey, you're too aggressive. You were too aggressive. Like, but they turned vegan from Gary Yarovsky. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. listen, listen to me. Most people I talk to are adults. Okay. We don't have to baby people. They are secondhand committing the worst abuse to animals on earth now yeah we can be respectful about it but to be direct and honest with people is what they deserve now that is what i would want now of course some people are going to be this is uncomfortable you're pushing your views you're imposing your beliefs on me i don't care about all of that okay i don't care about all of that what matters is that you get this message out there swiftly and you know, let let it land in a way that you know that people don't feel insulted. So I never I never go, I never walk up to someone and go, "You are an animal abuser," or you know, "You are a rapist," which is what the media like to say. I never say that. I would say, "Hey, did you know, like by that buying dairy products, animals are abused for that, sexually abused, have their children stolen for them." You know, so like just putting the onus on their actions and people can change their actions instead of accusing them of being an animal abuser. Now, of course, when someone consciously commits animal abuse knowingly and makes fun of that abuse, there's a different way to advocate to that person. I, I believe, you know, polite, uh, Socratic method. Well, you can still use a Socratic method, but I'd be a little bit more harsh and direct with someone who consciously knowingly commits animal abuse. And if they make fun of that abuse, completely different, but for the most part, people are unconscious animal abusers, not consciously aware of the, the abuse. So um, don't treat people like children too much. Uh, and, you know, people go, are you too aggressive, too aggressive? You could be as peaceful as Gandhi and people are going to say, you're pushing your views on me. So I think there's a spectrum and it's and being offended is very subjective. And I think we just need to give people perspective, um, some serious perspective 
in the way that resonates with you the best. So be authentic to yourself and just get the message out there. I think at the end of the day, everybody has their own style and there are different ways of approaching an issue. But to be honest with you, I actually don't think the way you approach people is wrong or anything like that. Um, and I really love the aspect that you're always asking the question, you're making it a very general topic, as opposed to just saying like what, what you said before, like you're an animal abuser, because I mean, nobody really likes to be put at the spot like that. But they're, I feel like they're more open when you speak generally, and you ask like questions like that, and it really gets people thinking. Mm. Yeah, open-ended questions. Um, do I think calling someone an animal abuser is not effective at all? Uh, look, if they're aware of why they're an animal abuser, maybe. But if they are like, – like it's such a far stretch. Like it's a really far stretch for someone to say that someone that's buying cheese, you're a rapist. Like like that there is – they're just going to be like, what? Yeah. What? Or like a dairy farmer is a rapist even. You know, like I don't go up to dairy farmers and go, hey, you're a rapist. I will say the act of artificial insemination, that euphemism, is rape. Okay. Now, I don't always call it rape, but I'm not going to not call it rape. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that that is what it is just because they're a different species of sentient animal to us and all of a sudden there's a distinction no, like, yeah, so <clears throat> just calling a dairy farmer a rapist, I don't think is as effective because people just disconnected completely from that. They're like, what are you talking about? That's insane. So you have to understand from their perspective, like, yeah, you've seen many cows be raped and many uh, calves be, be taken from their mothers and bolt gunned in the skull. They haven't seen it once. So offering the perspective, giving them the education based and saying, hey, what do you think that act is? Okay, replace the cow with a human. What would you call that? It's not a holocaust. Take the pigs out of the gas chambers, put human beings in there, and what do you call that? Okay, so that like we have to understand the disconnect to connect the dots. Okay, see, see it from and, – and I know it's hard because I live in a, in a world of focusing on animals be abused um, – Standing out in front of slaughterhouses, hearing animals scream for their lives in their last moments, um, seeing sitting on sanctuaries and hearing the stories of the survivors, these beautiful survivor stories, you know, rescued from the hands of evil human beings or com or good human beings committing act of e acts of evil because of their programming. Um, so yeah, it's really hard to go and have you know this compassionate conversation with someone and go uh, and understand the disconnect, but. I think that's where restraint and, you know, the, a bit of the skill and experience comes in. But again, I don't have, I'm not like the perfect individual. I have emotional outbursts sometimes. I get down and, you know, frustrated too. But I think always striving to be conscious of how we're getting the message across and how it's landing and evolving from there is super, super important. Yeah, that kind of leads me to my next question is like, how do you sometimes not lose it? I mean, you're encountering way more people than I probably do, you know, talking about veganism and you're encountering people that are like very against it. Maybe even like the farmers themselves, like the ones that are actually doing the abuse. Like, how do you not lose it? Like if it was me, if it was me in your spot, like I, I would just go crazy. I, I, I would lose it. Like I would be cursing. Like I, I would you know what I mean? Like mm. I would not be able to do what you're doing, but how do you kind of keep your cool in situations like that? I'm going to say for the most part, because I'm a human being. Okay. I'm not, I'm not some robot that, that is always like super polite and calm and res like I have an emotional spectrum. Okay. I, I feel for these animals. Okay. I, I tear up at the sight of, you know, animals being abused and, and, and saying goodbye to them out the front of slaughterhouses. I have, an emotional spectrum. It's important to show your human emotional spectrum, your passion to people, I feel, okay? You know, things that make you angry. Yeah, show that anger, but direct it in a, you know, it's about channeling your emotions, you know, in a, in a productive way, I feel like. And that's a bit of a skill. But for, for me, when I'm having a debate with a dairy farmer, I'm like, oh my God, the camera's rolling. 
Let's let's get this message out here. Right. Okay, so I'm thinking of me and him, and I'm thinking of who's watching. Yeah. Okay. Most of the time, but I take myself, my emotions out of the equation. I'm like, okay, I'm a vessel here. I'm a vessel here. I know exactly what to say at this part here. Okay. So he's saying this. Uh, we've done it for thousands of years, and something goes in my mind. Okay, tradition. How do I respond to tr tr tradition? Okay, just because we've done something for thousands of years, does that mean make it moral and should we continue to do it? Can you think of anything else we've done for thousands of years to each other that should be discontinued? You know, so when someone oh, there's there's a there's like a catalogue in my brain of ways to respond to to common excuses people have. So it's almost like I'm a computer here. Okay. And stay calm ask them a question and you can get them back on their back foot. It's it's better that they get frustrated and trip over their own stuff than you do. Um, and frustration usually comes from, from activists when they don't know how to respond to something, okay? Or they let themselves and their emotions get in the way of getting the message across to someone. Uh, it's almost like you when, when I'm in advocacy mode, I don't let things um, – I don't take things too personally, okay? Because I'm like, okay, that they've got no idea of what they're talking about in this, you know, they might be really smart in other aspects of their life, but they've done no research in this whatsoever. This is my ball game here. So I take myself out of the equation, my own person. I don't take things personally when, uh, you know, it's hard when someone says some snidey joke about, you know, the dairy industry and you've seen so much abuse. That can be really hard. Um, but yeah, taking myself out of the equation and just, okay, how do I respond to this to 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 get them to wake up? And if they say, say something really insensitive, insulting, or silly, I'm like, great, this is being filmed. So the the people who aren't yet vegan who are watching this are going to go, wow, that sounded really stupid. I think that too. You know what I mean? And they will start to wake up because that's that's what I get mostly with my emails. Hey, Joey, you know, I've seen you have this debate with a, with a farmer or, or an, an individual. I used to rattle off the same responses as they did. And you answered them, all the objections clearly, and it turned me vegan. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, great response is like you kind of have to be in that zone of like, not taking things personally, knowing what to say, practicing over and over again, and just getting the message out there and not really taking it personally, which I guess something that I would have to work on. Um, I've, I've never actually gone to uh, vigils before um, or, or any type of like vegan protests. I would love to get more involved in that, but I have seen um, slaughter uh, when I was young. Um, when I was living in Greece or we would go to vacation like in a village. And so it was like very rural there and our neighbors would actually slaughter goats. And I was like scarred ever since I was little. Goats. Um, yeah. Yeah. Goats. They scream like children, don't they? They're beautiful animals too. It's a shame. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, like I can't, I, I can remember that time. Like I can still, like if I close my eyes, I can remember it. But um, for some reason or another, through like social conditioning, I just went back to eating meat and, and all that. But it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely tough. So, um, yeah, I can, I can see how practice would definitely help in, you know, being out there and, and witnessing this over and over again, just kind of keeping your cool and props to you, man. The more I bear witness, um, the more it galvanizes in me. And for me, the, the harder it is for me uh, because... Uh, I, I thought I thought going out to slaughterhouses and seeing the trucks come in would get easier. Like I just honestly thought, like you know, after two three years of doing this, this is gonna get easier. But I still am dumbfounded, like completely astounded, that these massive truckloads of individuals who were all having their own experience subjective experience about the situation in their own way because they all have slightly different personalities that you can see some are more scared some are more abused some are more more like not really phased yeah. you know they're all their own sentient individuals and there's 
thousands upon thousands upon thousands coming in continuously day after day after day. It's it always astounds me. And I'm just like, and I leave a vigil and I'm like, what are we doing? You know what I mean? And you know what it does to me? Like people say, oh, you know, this is going to ruin me. No, it doesn't. That fire inside of my chest, I'm like, I have got to go do something about this. Let, what, let's do something about this. Come on, everyone. I go and inspire activists. Okay. Filming my, filming my vigils, putting them online inspires thousands of people to come and do it too. Okay. So people say, well, you know, what's the save movement going to do? What's standing out the front of a slaughterhouse with a sign going to do for animals? Well, every single one of my viral videos on Facebook came from bearing witness at the save, at a, at a save, having debates with farmers and slaughterhouse staff, um, showing the images of animals. So people connect, connect the dots from the animal that is in the back of the truck and the flesh that was torn from that animal on their plate. That's a huge connection to make. That's what the save movement does. You think it's just as easy as just standing out the front with a sign? No, we have phones. Phones are a window into an audience. We are bringing thousands and thousands of eyes out to the front of a slaughterhouse. When in history have we been able to do that? Right. When? In the 70s, they were probably doing it. There were animal lib activists in the 80s doing it. They didn't have phones, though. Mm -hmm. We've got phones. We've got huge platforms. Everyone get your ass out the front of a slaughterhouse. Bring your phone. Tell your friends. Show your family. You know, then they won't be so uh, so smart when they're saying, hey, look, I've got some meat here. When you show them the terrified face of the pig that was cut off. Yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely makes sense why the vegan population has grown every single year. It The power of the Internet, it's bringing it's exposing them. It's bringing all this knowledge to people and it's accessible as opposed to like you said, like back back in the day, like nobody would be going out to slaughterhouses. And now you can literally go there if you turn on your computer screen. Let me kind of shift um, this conversation into like a different direction. And like, I don't want anybody to think like I'm implying anything here. I'm just talking like, you know, theory with you. But um, do you think that um, there are more aggressive and effective ways in helping animals? Do you think going into slaughterhouses and actually actually like grabbing the animals and like it's just something that's in my mind like again i'm not implying like any activist should or should not do this but do you feel like more aggressive actions should be taken like just breaking in taking the animals and taking them somewhere safe so like liberations um like look direct action liberations where people are you know just jumping fences grabbing animals out um, going into farms and taking piglets and you know they might go in and shut down a slaughterhouse lock themselves to you know some slaughtering machine and or you know some conveyor belt and you know rescue animals and create a big scene there and the media comes and then when the media comes they're on the front page they're on the news and the liberated animals have their stories told and everyone's going oh my god what are they doing what are these crazy crazy vegans doing shutting down a slaughterhouse and rescuing this what's that is that my food is that animal my food oh my god i'm eat that that animal's being rescued from me do i think that's effective hell yes i do hell yes i do do i think people should stop doing it hey i'm not going to tell people to go and do something that's illegal mm -hmm. but it comes a time in history when, you know, we sort of wake up to the difference between what's moral, ethical, and what's legal. Exactly. So, you know, and, and do I think that that's the only – like, a, look, a lot of um, direct action, you know, legends think that that's the only way to advocate or that is – the only way things are going to change. And I don't agree with that. I think it is a brick in the wall of all forms of advocacy coming together for a massive, you know, it's like a big building of advocacy. Um, you know, so we've got, you know, the health advocates, which isn't really veganism, but it brings, it's like a big net. 
it's like a big net that brings people in to find the like the vegan core message which keeps people in that net you know like so and and you know the environment is another one you know let's not not forget the environment only matters you know in a moral way because of sentient individuals that live within the environment the environment doesn't matter in and of itself it is not a sentient being right nobody's advocating for mars or like yeah no, but you know what i mean <laughs> take sentient life off of earth the environment doesn't matter morally i mean it just doesn't um so do i think like these forms of activism um are effective well if you look at it just as in like if you took cameras away if you took the media away and you just like look you've liberated a life now that matters to that life that 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 action matters to that life to that sentient being Okay, they get a second chance. They got taken from hell. If that were you, would you go, no, it's not effective. Come on, <laughs> come on. If that were you in that slaughterhouse about to be murdered and some hero, an absolute hero came and rescued you, would you say that's effective? Of course it is to you. That's, that's Your life is everything, is all you have. That is your whole experience. That is everything you'll ever have is your life. And they've liberated that life. Now, in, t in terms of broader effectiveness, you share their story. You know, the media gets involved. You know, you use um, their story to advocate to other individuals that are causing, helping to cause this, you know, massacre of animals. So, yeah, I do. I do think it's effective. It's not the only way. Luckily, we have, you know, different ways of advocating and we can all be creative about that. But, yeah, I don't disregard direct action liberations or other forms of what could – what you might perceive as more extreme aggressive types. Yeah, it's just frustrating sometimes that the system is like, like it's definitely sometimes not on your side. Like I remember reading up a story once where, um, I think it was chickens where they were just like really injured and like sick at a farm and these activists just walked on there and picked them up and then the cops came and took the, the sick and injured chickens which would have just been left for dead. I doubt they would have even used it for food. I have no idea. But they just took those chickens out of those activists' hands, you know, and the activists were just trying to save, like, an injured animal. Because the, the, the police, because of the legal system, they're not chickens. They're property. They are not sentient individuals with rights. They are property. They're considered property. And they're worth about a dollar. You know, the, the chickens in that, like, live chickens are about 50 cents or a dollar or something. That's crazy. You know, in terms of their, their monetary value. We're talking about sentient individuals here. We're talking about, you know, that they, they see, they feel, they interpret their reality. They are suffering. You know, they're deemed property. Absolutely like the epitome of injustice. These slaves, they are slaves. They are not free. Um, this is why, like, people say, Joey, do you believe in a vegan world? 100% I believe in the vegan world. But more... Sooner than that, like sooner than that, we just need to give, like afford animals fundamental rights. Now, if we give animals fundamental rights to liberty, not to be viewed at as property, everything changes because taking away their liberty or harming that animal would be against the law. Do people break laws? Yeah, they break laws. We still harm, enslave, and murder each other, rape each other, uh, rape our children, okay? This is how human beings kill their own children. It's against the law. People, uh, you know, go to jail for the rest of their life. They still break the law, but that we have rights to protect us. This is what needs to come in before a vegan world because this is fundamental to a vegan world. We're not going to have a vegan world unless we – uh afford animals rights this is why i've got a problem a problem with animal welfare because they're not trying to give animals fundamental rights they're just trying to lessen the suffering while they're enslaved now um of course I'm, i don't want animals to suffer more but i just think we just need to fight for their one right and as we're doing that 
the system's going to tighten up the welfare guidelines and make sure they suffer less because they've got all of our eyes on their fighting for their rights. So, um, yeah, just animal rights will lead to a vegan world. You know, people were still going to kill animals. You know, people, we still kill each other, but at least it will be against the law. Yeah, yeah, and people will think at least twice before doing it or supporting it. Yeah, because people are that they they conflate legality with morality. They think because it's legal, it's moral. They just think, well, well, it's we're allowed to. You know, my friend works at a slaughterhouse, gets paid stabbing animals. Like they they are disconnected from history. Start like the Holocaust was legal. Like I don't know, like. Yeah, so we have to help make that distinction. I like talking to police officers about legality and morality, especially when it comes to animal rights. I just think it's a very productive conversation to have. That's very interesting to hear their perspective because they're standing there trying to protect and serve. And it's always interesting listening to their perspective as well. Yeah, it's nothing personal with police officers at all because they are simply doing their job. Um, you know, and, I th and police officers are always at vegan protests. Uh, which is amazing because they're non-vegan usually, and it's a great time to advocate to uh, the p police officers. They're just human beings at the end of the day. Um, they're not robots. Like, what do you do in order to reduce like your stress and kind of keep, you know, to look after your well-being? You know, being exposed to, uh, to all that. <laughs> this year, um, I got exactly what I was ready to receive in terms of what I could handle. Um, I think my, my view is like the universe will give you what you're ready for when you're ready for it. Like the, when the student is ready, the teacher will come and And I was ready for this year, but I did not expect it to be the year that it was. I mean, it's been absolutely huge, absolutely huge. And, you know, I used to exercise – Religiously, I would eat a healthy whole foods diet. I spent a lot of time on, you know, my, you know, physical health. And when I started my Patreon, I became a full-time activist and I was like, boom, activism, this is it. And I focused all of my spare time on activism. I didn't do really any sort of self-care. Um, while I wasn't touring, I was editing, you know, and I was trying to advocate online, which is still stressful, but a different type of stress. I think it's even more stressful because then the critics come out and then, you know, then, you know, you see either the effectiveness of your active act advocacy or, you know, some things don't go, go to plan. So in terms of stress, it really cannot be avoided as an activist. It has to be, managed and we need to support each other through it um right now after such a big year like i had i was had near breakdowns um but the good definitely outweighed the bad um i uploaded a video recently where i i, sh I shot some footage of myself like really at a low point and I, I wasn't gonna upload it but i thought i'd include it in my new year's video just to help other activists know that hey you know it hasn't always been easy for me so if you're feeling a little bit down, a little bit, you know, like overwhelmed, that's okay. That is okay. I do too, you know. Um, yeah, I put on my social media face and I put on my public advocacy face, but I'm not a robot either. Like I, I get affected by what people say, you know. It, it, it hurts me that, you know, animals are being holocausted. That, that really does hurt me daily. It hurts me when the community doesn't stand by um, – you know, my efforts, it, it does, but you know, it's okay to feel like that for the most part, there's been nothing but support, you know, that, you know, but it's almost like, um, sometimes you feel like, Oh, I'm in this alone. No, you're not. We're all in this together. You know, that time when you were feeling really sad and overwhelmed and like no one understood, we've all been there too. So that's the beauty of having community and, and we can access that community you know, online at the click of a button. So that's great. But in terms of me looking after myself, I've started my exercise regime again. Boom. The last three months I've been training super hard, weight training, um, cardio. I, I've leaned back down. 
I feel really, which is really good for my, you know, emotional state, my mental health, Definitely. physical health. I've been uh, eating healthier, um, so less processed food, and which which is it's my own personal choice. It's got nothing to do with uh, veganism, essentially. But I feel like you know, be, I feel like being a uh, you know, looking looking my best is a great way to advocate um, because people because I've got a, such a strong animal rights message. You know, if I look fit as well, it, it sends this new message like, wow, he actually looks. He looks all right, eh? Like, you know, he looks, looks pretty fit. So I think that that's a, a, a positive thing to add as well. For sure. But it, for the most part, my, my mental health as well. Um, also, I just think um, sometimes it can become overwhelmed. Like I'm putting in all this work and I'm not seeing the results immediately. And sometimes like you're used to such a high standard like you put in like hours and hours into something, into some content and it doesn't do as well as you thought it might. And, you know, YouTube might be messing you about. They might be, you know, censoring your video because you've put something in there they didn't like or the title wasn't right. Or like, you know, about 30% of the people in the comment section are against the way you've, you know, advocated or something like that. And it was all compounds and you haven't slept properly. And, you know, my tour, my recent tour, I was using caffeine to get up at 3 a.m. and fly here and do this vigil here. And and then I did a big interview debate with a big radio uh, presenter over there. And I was really emotional in it. And I come across as aggressive to a lot of the community. And, you know, uh, and you're trying your best and you've been inside slaughterhouses watching animals be stabbed and, it's, you know, and you're suffering PTSD from your past as well. So all of these things compound before you know it, you're just like, whoa, where am I? Like, who am I? What's going on here? I think taking a step back and going, okay, I need to recharge now, become being aware of where you're at going, okay, what am I going to do right now? I need to go, go get some nature you know, chill out, get off the caffeine, um, do something a little bit more giving. When you do activism that is fulfilling, watching animals be driven to their death every single day without feeling like you're doing anything to stop it leaves you feeling helpless. I don't want activists or vegans to feel helpless because they are not helpless. You can do something, even if it's just planting a seed, even if it's just leaving a card with someone at the supermarket that says dairy is scary on it. You know, these things are ways of you helping to change the situation for animals that make, you know, that might be making you feel helpless, like I can't do anything. Now that a helpless feeling doesn't help animals. If you feel helpless, it doesn't help animals and it doesn't help you. So I want people to know, like you could go out and have a conversation with someone on the street, like anonymous for the voiceless is an amazing platform to do that. And, you know, people stopping at the screens, they want to talk to you. They want to know what's going on. You have this amazing, fulfilling conversation. They, sh they sign up to challenge 22, which is, you know, an amazing coaching online, um, Facebook thing for people to, you know, try veganism for 22 days. They sign up to that. You go, wow, I've done something here. I feel fulfilled. I don't feel so helpless. And it lessens a lot of the the stress. And, you know, and that's what I invite people to do. If you're feeling helpless watching the animal abuse, you know, your friends and family aren't listening to you, like all of these things, and you're not doing anything fulfilling in terms of making a difference on earth, that is going to, that's a sure way to burn yourself out, I feel like. But uh, yeah, just being mindful of where you're at emotionally and mentally, um, balancing your activism out with, you know, some reach, something that's recharging, getting into nature, exercising, uh, doing normal people things, you know, whatever that might be for you uh, and doing rewarding activism as well as the stuff that's not too comfortable, like bearing witness and watching slaughterhouse footage and getting in uncomfortable situations and you know, doing something really rewarding where you feel like, you know, I'm making a difference in these animals' lives and I'm making a difference on earth here. And no matter what that person said about me, no matter how harsh that criticism was, I know that, you know, in my heart, I'm doing something that's helping to change the, the situation for animals on earth. And I think all of those things together will help you fire on. With me, 
I've put a loaded gun inside of my mouth. I was going to pull the trigger at one stage in my life. It was the, I, I should have been dead many times. I've spent time in, in uh, the psych ward detained as a patient. I've, you know, sat in solitary confinement after my grandfather died. I couldn't go to his funeral coming down off of drugs and, you know, I couldn't even kill myself in solitary. You know, I've been in these horrible situations. So the struggles that I get now, I have that perspective from my past and I'm like, you know, nothing can, I have this, this view that nothing can stop me. Nothing. You, you would have to literally kill me to stop me from doing this. You could take the internet away from me. I'd be on the street marching to starting an army of advocates to, to help stop and do some, some other form of activism. Like I wouldn't ever stop no matter what happened. And that is my mentality towards this. And, you know, having, you know, Never losing hope in your heart. It's not even hope for me. It's more like I know this is going to happen. I know um, what we are doing is working and I know what the outcome will be. Like I don't have blind hope and like any doubt in my heart. Okay. And I, I don't think that that's helpful either to have the consciousness that a vegan world isn't going to manifest or that animals aren't going to get their justice. I think we need to all collectively believe that this is possible for it to manifest okay and there's millions of us so millions of collective belief will manifest this reality so i think all of these things together um are what's going to drive this movement into the forefront yeah absolutely we uh, you know power in numbers like the more you know the more of us start speaking out about this the more people we get on board and and it's epic man and i love it um do you have any big plans for 2019? Anything you would want to share? Um, there's something big happening, but I don't really know much about. I know a lot, a lot about it. <laughs> I just I don't really want to release it till it till it goes down. Yeah, no worries, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and we, in terms of plans, I don't like to plan because I've I live my purpose from my heart space, like. I follow my heart and like if I'm like, okay, on this date here, I've got to be there. I like to have loose plans, but really like my reality unravels because of my intention. Um, so I have a clear intention and I hold that here and I'm focused. I'm very focused. And this is what happened last year. Okay. Yeah. We had to like sort of plan the tour, but the tour come about from spontaneously living through the intention that I had. Okay. And that's what I invite others to do is to follow your heart. Okay. And everything else will work out. Don't let fear hold you back because you live in the fear space. Nothing amazing happens inside of your comfort zone. Nothing. And that'll be my advice. You, you let fear hold you back. Your whole life will be held back. But if you let go of that fear and go, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to go for this. This is my passion. This is my. This is what matters most to me. The universe will just – it moves out of the way and amazing things will happen. So in terms of plans, yeah, I plan to take this to the next level on into another dimension. It's going to be bigger than it ever has been. I plan to – my mantra for this year is light up the world, okay, because the fire that was inside of my heart – Okay, that, that that I talked about before I was a full-time activist. That fire, I want to ignite other other vegans with that same fire. And so we can come together to be a really bright light and brighten the darkness that's been overshadowing the world. And that that is that is kind of like my vision. Epic, man. Yeah, I'm super stoked to see what you have going on this new year. Do you think you're gonna come to the States at all, maybe? I I can't come to the United States. Um for now, because I have a criminal history and it's the hardest country to come into, I would and and I'm an, uh, quite a controversial figure in the animal rights movement, uh, with many articles written about me, <laughs> which would also hinder my chances of getting through customs. They'd be like, "What are you going to do here?" Um, so yeah, even though the United States would be my right right this year, if if they said you can come, I would come there for six months. Like that's how much work I would do there. Like I would really love to, to, to go there and it's such a shame, but everything happens for a reason. Um, 
so hopefully in the future, if I ever get the opportunity, trust me, I will be there. But yeah, for now, I don't think it, it's possible. Darn, man. Yeah, well, if I'm ever overseas, I'll definitely hit you up and and uh, and see you know how I can help out. 100%, man. What can people do to support the movement and connect with you? You can follow me on all my uh, platforms, YouTube, uh, Facebook. Um, I have a Patreon page where people can get behind me financially. But in terms of what you can do to support the movement is follow your heart, speak with passion and conviction, and um, advocate in whatever way resonates with you the most. Be authentic to yourself. If you're an artist, paint pictures. If you're a singer, sing songs. If you like to film videos, make videos. You know, if you're a cook, cook some vegan food. Never forget the animals in your message. If you're a health advocate, trickle in the animal message too so people will get led there. If you're an environmental ad advocate, talk about the sentient animals that live within the environment and, you know, animal agriculture. Just let's not as a movement, forget the animals and forget, you know, the victims. Um, but yeah, always live through your heart space and never give up. And always remember there's a massive support system behind you.